Jackson, this is Chef aka Nomad Fury and we've just concluded the Token 2049 event so this is day one Ethereum Super Meetup okay so it was an amazing event and I'm going to show you a video clip of the question and answer portion together with the uh, Ethereum founder himself Mr. Vitalik Buterin and other uh, Ethereum leaders from all over the world okay so without further ado here it is questions for ideally any of the meetup organizers here about what's happening in their country uh, or of course if you have some telling question but ideally uh, you're kind of uh, spreading it out uh, any questions yeah go ahead shout it out yeah I have a question uh, because uh, you have a very tight and strong community relationship but out of the uh, Ethereum uh, community there's uh, a lot of uh, increasing hostility toward the uh, Ethereum so I would recommend you to hire a yeah, really good uh, PR uh, relations experts and government relations uh, relation experts Got it. Thank you very much. So we should hire. Uh, your suggestion is to hire a really good government relations expert in PR. Excellent. Thank you very much. Any other questions or comments? Uh, I guess we'll go all the way around. Go ahead, sir. This is actually a two-part question. Uh, I'm Mike from Quadrant Protocol. When you look at a lot of projects, they did POA, uh, so they did, did private chains. And then you know what? We're going to try to do this with the microphone. Maybe maybe what we do is uh, just try to hear. Uh, let it come forward. Uh, yeah, come, come forward with your question, and we'll we'll give you the mic. Uh, Hey, how you guys doing? Uh, Mike from Quadrant Protocol. A lot of projects over the last year, due to the scaling issue, were using POA, using private chains. Uh, with Plasma, hopefully a lot of that can be solved. Uh, so two parts on the technical side. One is that uh, will, um, will there be some support for the transition for companies who are doing private chains to then go back in the mainnet? And then two, on the community side, with the community uh, uh, events help out with projects to do that transition? Probably the, the part of the transition that kind of core developers will actively participate in is like just making and, develop and developing plasma implementations that are as easy as possible to kind of just plug and play and start using. And that's something that like Plasma Group, for example, has been uh, doing, a lot, doing a lot of work in and will probably can, and, and will definitely continue doing a lot more work in. And like the hope is ultimately like the, the like the, the small number of people on the foundation is not going to be enough to help everyone, and so we want to just build things that are uh, that are easy to use, so they're almost kind of self help, like basically help, like, are good enough that you can use them by yourself. And the main challenge I think will be for Buddha that, that I see, it, and this is a problem that we haven't fully solved yet, is that. The later twos that we've come up with are good for kind of simple payments and transactions and things like exchange, and that's a large portion of all the use cases. But we don't really have good kind of trustless layer twos for this general purpose smart contract computation. And that's, I mean, we will have scalable smart contract computation in Ethereum 2.0, but before, but before that, like something that's really just general, general purpose and plug and play and playable, like, you know, despite like all the really good efforts and people like L like L4 on um, the stage like and doing generalized state channels and the other projects that I think will like make general progress towards that, it's still not gonna be as like nice and convenient as just writing stuff in Solidity and Viper. But that it even that is a challenge we're trying to like move towards solving. Thanks. Uh, okay, so we'll go here and then we'll go there. Uh, just uh, do me a favor and uh, tell us who your question is directed to. Hey, I'm Zach with Minimal.app and NFT Ecosystem Project. This is for Vitalik. Earlier I mentioned NFTs, and I agree with what you were saying about how right now we have game items and these collectibles and they're kind of an early wave, but don't have much social impact. So what what would you see as the next wave of you know tokenized assets on NFTs that, that provide some sort of social impact or some adoption? Uh, sure. Um, so one category of thing that I'm interested in is the idea of like charities and nonprofit organizations and basically selling like badges like NFTs as a way of raising money. And like the idea would be that you would like let's say don't like donate something else to some like to 
to some nonprofit, get some, uh, get this badge in return, and then I mean, even just chat applications or Ethereum applications in general would kind of recognize these badges and give you a special status in some way. And that's something that I, I know there are projects that are kind of trying to do things in that direction, and it is something that I find, that, that I find really interesting. Um, I mean, all, trying to go beyond that, I mean, like zooming out a bit, there's also all of these use cases around like using blockchains to make um, non-profits, non -profit, non charities, but you know, the social third sector, whatever, in general, more transparent. And that's something that's interesting in theory, but I guess going to take some time in practice because like a lot of like basically for the first year, like for, for the first while until until you get everyone into the network, like when, when these organizations spend money, 95% of it is just going to go into a black hole that says I'm sex on the money apps. And it's like, because that's just the optimal way for them to spend their money because most of their expenses are really bad. So, and, and when you have that, well, you, you're not really gaining any meaningful like, tracking or verification benefits. So, coming up with like meaningful things to do that don't require you to just solve the network effects problem all at once is, I think, something that's very valuable too. Can I, can I follow up quickly? Then? What, what digitalizing files, like tokenizing ERC721 digital files, does that have any social impact? What do you mean by tokenizing files? Uh, maybe allowing someone to put a PDF as a 721 and sell that PDF as a 721. The problem is that doesn't like that doesn't solve the problem. Like first of all, that's not like selling access to the 721, right? Because it is uh, like ultimately, if you if someone downloads a file, they can resell the file. And if you put a hash of the file on the blockchain, then guess what? You're, you're actually made it easier to sell for people to sell copies of the uh, copies of the file to return without your authorization because you have a thing that anyone can check it against and verify that the file is the original. So I think that like actually one if we're talking about like IP like things, then tokens might be good for like as like access tokens to some application. Like even Access like even just things like games that require where you can like pay some amount and then like, you have you like, you just have the ability to play it like for forever and things like that. Then that's something that yeah like the blockchains can be fairly good at. Um, I mean you can also and there's also these ideas around like tokenizing tokenizing artwork and like people who will hold it kind of want to buy it for like, a feeling of ownership or whatever. That's I know lots of people have tried that, and none of that seems to have like really taken off yet. Just jump in on that really quickly. Uh, on in terms of the social impact, um, you know, kind of being involved with a number of uh, charitable organizations, including uh, Social Alpha, um, I think you should think about tokenization in terms of finding ways to back the token with a value, and sometimes that value is going to be offline. So one of the things you've been thinking about um, with some of the other charities that uh, in this uh, other space is. Uh, experiences. How do you create a signaling token or like a badge that can be kind of granted, um, you know, for a donation, and that badge represents an experience. Now that's going to be offline, right? You're going to have to somehow connect it to. But I think that's how you start to get around and really make value for the for the owner of the badge and then um, also for the charity. So, um, sorry, can I just add one more example to that? Um, just where we're using um, an ERC721 to represent a digital, uh, sorry, a physical asset. So in the supply chain, that's a common example people have spoken about for a while. And um, yeah, in agricultural, we're doing just that. Like we're trying to get wheat onto the blockchain, um, pigs onto the blockchain. Something that will actually, in that specific domain, like the, the UN project in Papua New Guinea, it's to help the farmers who have the asset that maybe are effectively unbanked by tracking their physical asset on the blockchain with an, with an NFT. Um, it, it gives them power. And in the wheat industry, farmers in Australia have a problem with getting paid um, by having their digital asset again, uh, sorry, their physical asset on the blockchain. We can help um, get payment to them sooner rather than waiting 60 to 90 days they wait. So, yeah, it's just some real examples. Just actually published a paper on using uh, food traceability in 721s with the IEEE. So, oh, right on point awesome. with Thanks. Yeah, thank you. Uh, so, this is also a question directed to Vitalik. So uh, our firm is called Mixed Marvel and we dedicate ourselves to blockchain gaming. So first product is called Hyper Dragons, it's still on Ethereum. So next product is called Hyper Snakes. And uh, it's a version of Slither IO on blockchain. So we're trying to solve the problem of mass adoption. So basically users don't need to like, install the wallets 
at the first stage, and uh, TSS NFT on ERC-21 and logic similar to a certain key consensus on the So my question is that, uh, so it's really hard to get to the core user base of Ethereum. For instance, uh, are the blockchains, are the options, the whole marketing team that work together with us for PR and see how to like, drive the users into our games? So actually, I just want to know like, for Ethereum, how can I get access to the core user base? Basically, users in Ethereum. It's very diverse, but in terms of our friends. Honestly, like, these people have closer access to a lot of the core users in Ethereum than I do. So. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 How should that access to the Ethereum for you to this? So, like, it is so wide open. I mean, if you have to say something, it would be. Um, but everyone here has mentioned the immune you know, efforts that they're running, the um, events that they're running on a regular basis. So I guess wherever you are or whichever community you're trying to reach out to, um, yeah, approach the community leaders or approach the meetups themselves and then it's probably going to be open to post that. Uh, I think your question is more directed towards a specific gaming community within the user base. Uh, the user base is probably someone at large, it's a public community out there, right? So when you mean by getting direct access to the user base, I think it's pretty much more on efforts on your own kind of end. Uh, getting marketing out there, getting PRs on legend out there. So it's more pretty much about you finding that kind of adoption. Because there, there is no magic uh, audience out there that you can tap into. If there is one, uh, I, I, don't, I, I don't want to answer the question. Because we saw like mass adoption being a very specific topic in your presentation today. And you definitely want to see a um, Kind of coming out to like satisfy it is, it is uh, frictions, it, there are of course friction that exists in user experience, which a lot of companies are trying to solve. Uh, you have things like wallets, you have explorers, and all that stuff that are trying to streamline the entire user experience from talking directly to the blockchain to talking to an application. Right? So that's where I think that the current user base that you're referring to exists in those gateways that you could streamline the entire experience into making it a very easy one. Okay, thanks. Yeah, thank you. This is directed towards Vitalik. Um, for a mobile developer, if I'm trying to connect the Ethereum wallet to a, a non-custodial mobile app, is there a, a way to do that, um, like an SDK or something, that I don't have to create my own custodial app in order to use an Ethereum wallet in an app? That's a very good question. Um, in terms of like the most useful thing, know that the um, I mean, first of all, you can uh, you can only, you can build an app inside a, inside of a, a a website, and then like the various mobile yeah. browsers work. But then I know there are wallets that are starting to kind of support the like the ability to kind of use them inside of other applications. So like for example, I know like HTC's wallet has like, an integration with Opera where they can you know, do that. But I think that's more a kind of wallet by wallet thing and it hasn't really been standardized yet. Okay. Uh, I have a question uh, that's not uh, related to the uh, PR or something very technical but for the community and um, there's uh, uh, several global com Ethereum com uh, communities here so I have a question that uh, for all of you, all of you that uh, from your perspective, uh, what is the uh, ideal governance model for uh, Ethereum community? What is the ideal? What's the ideal governance model for the Ethereum community? It's a really good question. Who wants to go first? <laughs> uh, do you mean for local community or the global community? What's the same location? How do you guys self up? Yeah, so um, we 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 have a thirty uh, organizers, and if we we want something to move, like we we want uh, to attend this event, okay, uh, I need a uh, free approval for from uh, thirty of you. Um, we we kind of uh, work like this. Uh, Hi, uh, regarding the question about what is ideal um, to the community or source of funds, 
Uh, how are we funding our community with the dollars. The governors. The governors. The governments. Ah, uh, okay. So what we do is that um, with our event, so we try to publish it in each and every communities that we have. We have a group of leaders in each and every cities. So we try to talk to them first and explain to them what would be the meetup is about. So what would be the topic. So we try to gather all the community leaders and then afterwards we ask their help to support the meetup. So all of our meetups are self-supported. So what we do is that we connect together with, with all of the regional leaders in, in the community. So that's how we, we do the events. Uh, a black girl from Metallic and uh, things happen um, every and I talked about uh, I contact with him when he was the coordinator for the hard work and I was wondering your opinion on that. My opinion on like, what part of that is? Uh, I'm also on the community side and the, and the whole uh, uh, how to Organize or and make a make a greater community and uh, phenomenon. Yeah, I mean, I think like, a lot of the stuff in the community um, in the community that we've been uh, discussing the last uh, co couple of weeks, like basically happened because of these. Like, there were a lot of uh, kind of norms that you, that people weren't really, weren't, weren't really clear on. So, like for example. If you have some particular, some one, one does a position like a maintainer, a maintainer, or, or like a rent moderator, or whatever, or whatever else actually mean? Like, is it is it more like a, a, a janitor? Is it more like is it like a high priest? Is it something in between? And like, what kinds of expectations we have of the uh, of people in these uh, in these positions? And that's something that like, I don't think I can dictate myself. I don't think it's something that any of us can, di can dictate ourselves. It's just something that people just have to talk with each other more and, 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 and try to come to more of a common understanding. Um, another kind of bro broader topic that ended up uh, kind of getting touched on is also just what is the relationship between the Ethereum community and kind of other kinds of communities that are not Ethereum. Yeah, because uh, like if it's just like issues that are just within the within the Ethereum community tends to be easier to solve. But if we're talking about people that are part of this or also part of this, and then people like there's some kind of uncertainty is about oh is this per is this person really looking out for the best of, for for the best of the Ethereum ecosystem? Is like do they have kind of other interests that they're not that they're not revealing? Why are they saying? Why are they saying this? And that's like a kind of situation that's harder to navigate. And that's also something that I mean, we have less we have less experience in navigating. And I mean, I feel like the Ethereum community kind of has like a in general a widely shared goal of like trying to be friendly with ecosystems ecosystems outside of Ethereum where possible. But you know, if there are other ecosystems that do, that just don't feel like don't return the favor, then like how do, how do, are we going to respond to that? That's also one of those things that just the community just needs to talk and come to more of a common understanding on. Two more questions. Last two questions. There and then okay. Hello. I'm Gary Selma, Chairman of Swiss Capital Group. So the question is for everybody, but uh, I'm a fan of uh, Ethereum as a personal friend and also the friend from the group's uh, holdings. Uh, uh, we have a software bank, and uh, our belief is that under the holy grail of the uh, adoption and the application of the blockchain technology is into two, two sectors. From our belief, one is about the currency market that's running at 8 to 10 T every day, and secondly, it's about the central banking. In order to avoid or try to improve some of the problems of the banking legacy. So, as a 25 years banker, so this is some of our belief. My question is, um, we will be uh, issuing software, software and those standard uh, cryptocurrency for the market, not for speculation, but actually we hope to really do it for the good of people, 
everybody in this planet. We want to open a better path for the 6 billion people in this planet. We want to really nurture a very reliable, gold standard bag of cryptocurrency for the market. And we love Ethereum, but the speed, you know, my question is about the speed. For the moment, I mean, the speed is uh, uh, not acceptable for, for, for the moment, but I want to hear every one of you from you. How, what is the roadmap for the, about the, uh, the speed issue? Because now, yeah, sure. What That's a right question. Do you mean like speed of technical development? TDS, TDS. The TDS. The TDS. TDS. Basically what I talked about today, right? The uh, like layer two is charting. Yes, what, what would be the roadmap for in the near future? Instead of like, yeah, 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 what is that? Yeah, I mean, in the, in the very near future, I think, like, the layer two solutions are the thing that's probably going to come first, and, like, some of them uh, have uh, la launched uh, already. So I think, uh, I mean, there was something today, I forgot the exact name, but it's, I think it might be diecart.io or something like that, so there's it's basically like a paid channel implementation. There is a plasma that came out about a month, um, about a month ago, there's uh, like there are these all of these different solutions that are starting to like happen and pop up and they do exist and they're generally all in this kind of testing stage and they'll mature over a few months and they'll turn into something that like lots of people can start using. I think um, the one problem though is that if we see if we have these like fifty different layer twos and then they don't end up meaning much because nobody uses them, and that could be a problem. So one thing the community can also think about is like basically how do we actually encourage people to like try adopting and uh, using and like helping these uh, layer two ecos the ecosystems around these layer two projects like start to grow. And in the kind of in the longer term, there is obviously sharding as well, but then there's also layer twos on top of sharding. So like. These things are coming, and I think it's important for people to kind of be aware of, you know, what exists now, what will exist six months from now, what will exist a year or two years from now, and like depending on who you are as a user, there's a lot of like, different ways to take advantage of that information. Uh, last one, last question. Yeah, we're going to signal, signal out Veronica over here. So I moved to the Philippines from New York, and I just want to know how, like, uh, what areas in the Philippines are more supportive towards crypto, um, crypto scene compared to others, and how do you foresee the future of the Philippines when it comes to crypto? Thank you for that question. So um, the areas that the government, actually our government right now is very well supported comes to the innovation, smart and sustainable city. And so as uh, we are now going to build a crypto hub in the Philippines. And CESA is actually releasing different types of licenses to almost uh, for exchanges. And we are welcoming all the blockchain related projects in, in our country. And also Union Bank just first launched the first ADM machine that is endorsed by Union Bank itself. And we believe that he, he told me, the VP told me that um, they're going to use the, uh, to take Ethereum and Bitcoin. And in order for you to to buy the Bitcoin and Ethereum, you need to be a bank client. So that's how supported they are in the technology. Okay. Okay, uh, regarding, I can just add something. Uh, I guess the building is going mainstream, um, especially what we are doing also right now with uh, Crypto Massive, which is a roadshow, and we are partnered also with major university groups. And regarding the most active area, because you're now in the Philippines, it's in Manila. And also, uh, of course, the three major cities, Cebu and Dava. Thank you. Cool. Okay, I think that's, uh, that's it we need to wrap up for tonight. I um, wanted to say once again, thank you to all of you for staying. Thank you for your questions. Thank you to all of you for your time. Thank you to Token 2049 for all the support. It's a great partner in making it possible. Thanks a lot. See you tomorrow. Okay, guys, now you have seen the question and answer portion. So I hope you.
I hope it really answers the question that you have when it comes to Ethereum, okay? So thank you so much for tuning into this video. So feel free to share this to your friends and make sure guys don't forget to subscribe to my YouTube channel. Just click the subscribe button below so that you can stay updated on what is going on with the cryptoverse, okay? So this is all for now. Thank you so much. My name is Jeff, aka Nomad Fury, and see you in my next video.